Domain-driven design can help you develop a rich domain model, but patterns like aggregates, entities, and value objects can be complicated to map to the database. So let's see how we can use domain-driven design with EF Core. We're going to look at a few entities, and then I'm going to show you how you can map these entities to the database using EF Core. First, I have the order entity, and there are a few things that need to be mapped here. One is the order ID which is a strongly typed ID, meaning we have an object representing the order ID, wrapping the actual ID value, which is a GUID. We also have a customer ID referencing the customer entity. Again, it's using a strongly typed ID. And lastly, we have a list of line items, which are encapsulated inside of the order entity inside of a private read-only field. So these are the things that we need to map with EF Core. Let's also take a look at the line item entity. First, we have the primary key of the line item, which is again a strongly typed ID. Then we have two foreign keys to the order and product entities. And we have a value object representing the price. The value object itself contains two properties, the currency and the amount. On the product entity, we also have a strongly typed ID as the primary key. We have a price as a value object and we have a stock keeping unit or a SKU as a value object again. This value object is simpler. It only contains a string value, so it's less complicated than the money value object. And on the customer entity, we just have two properties, which are the email and the name. It's probably going to make sense to include a unique index on the email property. So I'm going to also show you how to do that. So let's head over to the persistence project where I already installed EF Core and I added the PostgreSQL entity framework provider, which is MPG SQL. I configured the provider in the onConfiguring method and inside of the onModelCreating method, I added a call to apply the configurations from the assembly containing our database context. So now we're going to be defining entity configurations for our entities and they're going to be automatically applied to our database context. And then we're going to examine the generated migration files to see how this is actually going to be mapped to the database. So let's start simple. I'm going to create a folder that is going to contain my configurations. And we're going to start out from the customer entity because it's the most simple one of all. So let's create a customer configuration. And we're going to need to inherit from a type provided by EF Core, which is the entity type configuration. Now it's a generic interface and we have to specify what is the entity that we are configuring. In this case, this is going to be our customer entity. So if we implement this interface, you can see that we only have access to one method, which is the configure method, and we get an entity type builder of customer, which is going to help us configure our entity. So the first thing we should do is we should configure a primary key. So we do that by calling builder has key and we specify an expression to select the primary key. In the case of the customer, this is going to be the ID field, which is a strongly typed ID. If you leave it like this, any framework is going to throw an exception because it doesn't know how to map a customer ID into a scalar value at the database, which it can store in a column. So you have to tell EF Core how to convert this ID into a value, and you do that by defining a conversion for this property. So we're going to say builder property, and let's select the ID property, and now we call the has conversion method. So now we have to tell EF Core how to map the customer ID into a primitive value in the database. So we write an expression and we say, just select the customer ID value. And then we have to tell it how to convert from the database back to our strongly typed ID. So we can write an expression like this one where we get back a value from the database and we create a new customer ID from that value. So this defines a conversion for our strongly typed ID. And this is what you need to do to work with strongly typed IDs in EF Core. Let's also add length constraints for the two remaining properties on the customer. So I'm going to say that the customer name has a max length of 100 characters and that the email 
also has a maximum length of 255 characters so it has max length of 255 and let's also define an index how you define an index with ef core is you call the builder has index method then you specify which field you are defining the index on or it can be multiple fields if you want to index on a few columns but i only want to index on the email and then you can chain a call to is unique to tell the database that this should be a unique index because this is an email and we don't want to allow two customers to have the same email. So this is the customer configuration. Nothing too special here because we only have the strongly typed ID. And now let's see a more complicated example. Let's take a look at the product configuration where we have a few value objects. So product configuration and we have to inherit from the I entity type configuration interface and specify the product as the generic type and let's implement this interface. So I'm going to quickly define the key as the product ID. I'm also going to add a conversion for the product ID. So I'm going to say product, product ID has a conversion and then we do that like this. We map the product ID to the value and we map back the value into a new product ID. So this takes care of the value conversion from the product ID strongly typed ID into a GUID at the database level and back. Now I mentioned that we have few value objects on the product. We have the money value object with the amount and currency and we have a stock keeping unit with just a value. For the stock keeping unit, we can either define a value conversion or we can define it as an owned entity. Because the stock keeping unit is only wrapping a string value, it's probably simpler to define a value conversion. So let's take that approach. It's going to be pretty much the same as this here. So I'm actually going to copy that and then I'm going to change the thing that needs changing. So we're mapping the SKU property and at the database level, we are sending the SKU value, which is a string. But when we get back a value from the database, which is a string, we need to map it to a SKU object. How we do that is by calling SKU.create and you just map the SKU value that you got from the database. And now this is going to complain that this may be null. The simplest solution is adding a null forgiving operator because you're going to make sure through your application logic that a null value never makes it to the database. Now let's see how we can configure a complex value object like money, which has two properties. So with EF Core 7, which is the version I'm using right now, we have access to the owns one method, which allows us to define an owned entity that belongs to the product. We can say that the owned entity in this case is the price of the product let me actually show you how you can configure the owned entity. So this would be the price builder. And let's see what we have access to. So it's an owned navigation builder and it has much of the same methods as the entity type builder as we had earlier. And let's say that we want to configure the properties. Let's tell the database that the currency has a maximum length of three because we want to only be using the currency codes in our database, for example. And lastly, let's configure the order entity to see how we can configure our navigation collections and some foreign keys. So order configuration. And again, we inherit from the I entity type configuration interface. And I'm going to specify order as the generic type. We're going to import that and implement the missing method. And let me quickly add the primary key, which is the order ID. Of course, I'm going to need to define a conversion, which I'm going to actually copy from here to save some time. So this is going to be O for order. This is going to be order ID and this is going to be order ID. So this is our conversion from the order ID strongly typed ID into a good value at the database level. On the order, we have to configure a few things. One is the foreign key relationship to the customer. And another is the relationship to the list of line items. So let's configure first the customer. 
how you configure a relationship is using has one for a one-to-one -one relationship or calling has many for a one-to-many relationship. In our case, the order can only have one customer, so we're going to call has one. Now, because we don't have a navigation property on the order entity, I'm going to use this version, which is generic, so that I can specify which entity I'm referencing, in this case, the customer. And then I have access to a few methods, like with one and with many on the customer side, so that I can tell EF Core if the customer can have one or many orders. In this case, the customer can create many orders, so we call with many. And we can also configure the foreign key on the order entity, which is the customer ID. So this is the basic configuration you need to define a relationship. You can also say if it is required and what is the delete behavior, such as cascade on delete, client cascade, restrict, no action, and so on. So I'm going to omit this part here and I'm going to leave that this is a required relationship. Now let's tackle the line items, which are going to be actually very interesting because I do not have a navigation property for the line items on the order. So there are two ways how you can approach this. One is to define a shadow property to tell EF Core that it should use the backing field to access this navigation. The other is to expose the actual navigation, which I'm going to show you. So for the backing field approach, all you have to do is say builder property, and then you have to manually type the name of your property. The name of our field is line items. If I go back to order, this is what I'm actually referencing. The problem is that this is hard coded. And if the name of this field ever changes in the order class, then you're going to run into trouble. So the safer approach would be to, on the order entity, expose a navigation property that is read only for the line items. What you can do is this. You can expose a public I read only list or collection. Let's go with read only list of line items. Let's call it line items. And you're only going to give it a getter. And what you're going to return from this property is line items and you can create a new list. So this is going to return a read-only list from this property and it's going to return a copy of the line items from the order so that no one can access the original line items collection by reference. So if I go back to the order configuration, I can say line items and then I can configure them. So we actually want to define a relationship here. So I'm going to say builder has many this is going to configure a one-to-many relationship between the order and the line items. So we can say order line items. The line item belongs to only one order, so we call with one. And we can define a foreign key on the line item side, which is the order ID. So this is enough to configure the relationship. And we are still going to be using the backing field in the order entity for working with the line items. We just expose a property so that it's easier to configure our relationship with EF Core, but EF is still going to be using the line items field when setting the values on the line items. So let's quickly add the line item configuration, and then we're going to generate a migration, and we're going to see what we get from EF Core. So we have to implement the I entity type configuration, specify line item. And we're going to quickly say builder has key, specify the line item ID. And we're going to say that builder has one product to define a product relationship. The product can belong to many line items. And the foreign key is on the line item side, which is the product ID. And we can also define the price of the line item as a value object. So I'm going to say builder owns one and we're going to specify the price of our product. One more thing that is missing here is the conversion of the strongly typed line item ID to the primitive type in the database. So I'm going to add this as well. And with this in place, let's try to create a migration with EF Core 
and let's examine what we get inside of the migration file. I'm going to create the migration from the PowerShell in Visual Studio by calling add migration and specifying the name of our migration. And I'm going to let EF Core create this. And you can see that was pretty quick. And let's examine what we get inside of the generated migration. You can see that we first have the customers table, which has the three columns, the ID, which is properly mapped as a GUID or UUID in PostgreSQL. We also have the character varying for email and the name with the proper maximum length. And the primary key is the customer ID. Then we have the product table. You can see the ID again properly mapped. And take a look at first the SKU, which was our value object wrapping the string value which is just mapped to a text type in the database. And then we have two columns here for our owned entity, which is the price. If you recall, the price value object is actually a money instance, and it has two properties, the currency and the amount. So what EF Core does with owned entities is it maps each property as a single column in the database, and then it applies this naming scheme where you first have the property name on your entity, and then you have the corresponding property name on the owned entity. So we end up with price currency and price amount at the database level. If you recall from the product configuration, we set the maximum length on the owned entity, which is the money, to three characters. And you can see this is properly applied at the database level. So let's take a look at the next table which is the order. It only has the ID and the customer. But take a look here. The foreign key to the customer's table is properly configured. And lastly, we have the line items table. Again, it has the foreign keys and the primary key. Everything works just fine. The price is properly mapped as a known entity. So we have the price currency and price amount columns. A few things are left here we have a few indexes. Here's the unique index on the customer table on the email column. You can see that the name of the index is IX customer email and unique is set to true because we want the index on the email column to be unique. And then we have a few indices here on the foreign key columns that is going to speed up our joins. Let me know in the comments what you think about using domain driven design with EF Core. I think EF Core plays really nicely with DDD and allows you to implement most of the DDD patterns without much trouble. If you enjoyed this video, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm and until next time, stay awesome.